And you still ever get to do this between popping and locking? That's starting simple. We can do that. All right. E e easily put, popping is consistently contracting your muscles. So the, the basic element of popping is to do this. Yeah. Right? Locking is more fluid movement. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Well, it looks the other way, right? Because you think locking is you would lock, but popping. Well, locking is based off of this. When you stop and lock your joints up okay. for this one particular move. But there are other parts that you can lock, and like this will be a lock. But popping is continuously doing it. So in order to pop, you have to like keep doing okay. this while you're dancing. But they also have boogaloo, so it's a mixture of popping and boogaloo, where boogaloo is just like body rolls and head rolls and hips and knees and things. And you would do the two together, where locking is consistently just like this fluid motion that's based off a bunch of party dances, but then has all these like moves in it. So when you see them, they look completely different. Locking is, isn't locking uh, what's happening, what's his name? Yeah, Fred Barry Rewind, yeah. Yeah. He, 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 he was one of the original lockers. Yeah, but yeah, they, they look, when you see them, they look completely different. But they're like four years apart. All right. And uh, the one of the, like they mentioned the confusion, and one of the things was like when the, the lockers were the most popular dance group, mm -hmm. and when the poppers came out, <laughs> they were influenced by the lockers, so they dressed like lockers. You know, with all the striped socks and the hats, but they were popping. But nobody knew what they were doing because it was new. Right. So when they would go to LA and just, you know, let people have it and do all this stuff, dress like lockers, and leave and not tell anybody what they were doing, people started making up stuff. They're like, oh, it's this pop locking thing going on. And then I spoke to a few people in LA from back then, and they thought that this particular move right here was pop locking. I don't know why, but. That was the thing, just, you know, people seeing it, not knowing what it was, and giving it a name. One of the things um, I definitely want to talk about uh, in there in the beginning for the hip-hop section where it mentions that hip is uh, a West African word from Wolof. The one thing I would like to be clear, we kind of changed this. Like, this is really a rough edit. Like, when it, when it comes out, it's going to have all the flash stuff, you know, and all the nice transitions and all that. But the one thing about that, we kind of changed that up a little bit because this is an ongoing debate, which, like, really got its jump start in the 60s by uh, David Dalby, who is a, a scholar in West African languages. And um, it's been debatable ever since then. There are some scholars that agree with him. There's um, David Leland, who came out with a book in 04 called Hip, The History. Um, where he says it was cultivated by uh, slaves from West Africa here. There's other people that agree with him, like Joseph Holloway in 05, he came out with a book, um, Afri uh, Africanisms in American Culture. Pretty much says the same thing, like looking at different words and their etymology. But uh, one person that jumped in the mix, uh, Jesse Shedlo Shedlower, who is uh, editor at large for Oxford English uh, Dictionary. He claims that the etymology is wrong, that the origins of the word hip and hep are unknown, and that uh, actually the word in question, he says in Wolof, it's, they don't generally use an H, so the word is actually spelled X-I-P-P-I. -I. Um, so whether the debate, what it is, what it's not, I'm not here to jump into that debate and you know give concrete evidence. The thing I find interesting about it is that they all agree that in Wolof, the word hippie, however it's spelled, means to open one's eyes. Loosely translated here for us is to be aware, which is kind of saying the same thing. So I just look at that word like, 
whether Wolof, whether here, we're still using that same definition that you know what's going on. And even in the 70s when they changed it, you know, from HEP to I again, you still have that same thing. Now there's still debate about, you know, when it surfaced, because some people say that the word first got popular around the turn of the 20th century and that it wasn't, you know, commonly used among black people. Um, some people say it's uh, from the phrase, uh, put your hip boots on, which meant to be prepared for whatever. Um, others say it was from the phrasing, um, well, I can't think of it right now. Uh, to, to, I think it was to be on the hip. Yeah, to be on the hip, which was uh, pretty much a description of people who smoked opium. And from, it was based on that body position from smoking opium to be on the hip. And then others say it was from the actual March chant, Hep 2, 3, 4. So it's all types of debates, but like I said, I find it interesting that it still means that you're, the way we look at it in street culture, that you're aware of what's going on. And again, hop, other than the actual verb action, in slang terms, you usually consider that with the dance. Because you have things like 1957, Danny and the Juniors had a song called At the Hop. We were talking about dancing. You had hop around the clock, which loosely meant to dance all night. You had people that went to sock hops, which you just dance in your socks. You know, so that has always been with the dance. So it's how I look at it when we use it now. I just broaden it from just saying dance to celebration, whether it's MCing, it's DJing, it's whatever, how we look at it now. And I think the interesting thing is that, you know, cultures are built out of concepts, and hip hop to me is just a, a really strong concept, more so and this is very arguable, more so than a highly developed culture. For some reason, that's just in my head. Um, it pulls from, from the ideas of cultures, but for me, there's some things I expect in certain cultures that I don't see in hip hop. There's no traditional dress, not for real. There's no traditional ceremonies. You could say a coming of age thing would be getting into a circle or getting into an MC battle, but what about those people that don't do that? So then I guess you would say they don't have a coming of age in the culture, which doesn't make sense to me. There's not like a hip hop traditional wedding. There's like some things that's not there, but it's still strong in concept. To me, I don't even agree with, like I was telling some, I was telling Vince on the way here, I was like, Adidas are not hip hop. <laughs> They're sneakers. Nah, when they were made, yeah, they were made before hip hop and they weren't designed specifically for hip hop. They just happened to be something that people in the hip hop community like. What is hip hop is to wear Adidas with fat laces or no laces. That's the concept of hip hop. Jeans are not hip hop, but if you roll one leg up and you're walking around like LL, that's the concept of hip hop. You see what I'm saying? Kangos were not specifically made for hip hop. They have nothing to do with hip hop. It's just that that community of people like them for whatever reason. Maybe the, you know, the hottest dude, the hottest girl, they looked hot and what they was rocking and everybody else jumped on it. But, you know, we get into this thing, well, no, nah, that's hip hop. And it's, it's an aesthetic quality that to me is a bit skewed because anyone removed from a hip hop community will see it and think, well, that's what I'm supposed to do to be hip hop. I'm supposed to dress like that, which makes no sense to me. Because we all might live in West Philly and this is how we dress in West Philly. But North Philly dressed completely different, right? But somebody from California see it and was like, oh, no, that's hip hop, I'm gonna dress like that. Why? Why are you dressing the way we dress? This is what we do in our community. It has nothing to do with you. I think that's kind of like what he was saying, like with the dancing is, is people look at the moves and they try to just do this and then yeah. it's not about counting it out and doing that. Right. It's about the feeling that they had when they did it. Yeah, and it's about what what either is going on in, a, in that time period that may speak to you um, in a social economical situation or political or what have you that really touches you in a way. Like when James Brown came out, James Brown got a lot of pressure from the Black Panthers when he came out with I'm Black and I'm Proud. But that sparked a lot of conversation, a lot of activism, a lot of everything. And it said, like Crazy Lake said, it said something to a lot of people, which when they danced to that record, it, it really meant something to them. It wasn't just about being black, because it, it, it translated to anybody. You were proud to be white, you were proud to be Latino, you were proud to be whatever. And it just says something to you, and the music does that versus arbitrary movement, and you have no connection to the music, there is no emotional attachment, and you're just trying to mimic that with no purpose behind it. 
And that's I think that's a lot in hip hop with MCN with everything. Yeah. Um I two one was a question and one's a comment. I'll make the comment first. I love the juxtaposition of the earlier footage with the later mm. moves. I mean, because you do that several at several places in the film, and right. I just think it's real. It, they're very powerful images. Um, in part, I think because one can assume that, let's say, in those later images between earlier, let's say, it's 1930s and 40s dance moves um, juxtaposed against uh, late I, I, 20th century, early 20th, first century moves, that these young people at the end of the 20th century weren't necessarily watching right. the movies, right? So, um, you know, it, it was, it's just, they're really, really well done. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say Thank that you. I think that the, he had a really good eye for it. Um, unrelated question. So where are the women in all of this? That was my, that was um, my question. Because you started to get to it, it seemed like, where you were cutting it off, and maybe that's where you're going in your next 30 minutes that you said you're working on, but... We're definitely if, getting if more. If you're not going there, you better go. Oh no, there. we're 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 getting more women. The funny thing is, uh, there are particular women that I've chosen, and some of them don't want to be a part of it. I don't know why. Um, I, you know, I want Hi Hat and Fatima, who are very successful in the commercial world today, who were very popular in the clubs back in the day. They're one of the few choreographers who are in the business that is actually from the culture and that can, at one time, represent it as we see it, like they would get in the circles and get down. Big Les, um, we didn't get to that part when I do it. There's a part in there where I show circles, I show Big Les in the circles. She's like, took her shoes off, had a dress, does a backflip, she's getting it in. She does a radio station in LA. She doesn't want to do it. The Gucci girls, I can't find them. And I've been on the hunt. So I want to get the women, I think, one thing that happened with not seeing that generation of women so much is, and I mean, because there are a lot of women, there are a lot of male dancers that we don't see no more because of just growing up. Life, stop dancing, got a job, family, what have you. So a lot of them aren't as active and just kind of separated themselves from that. That was, that was then, I grew up doing it then. I'm not a part of that now. So I'm trying to find them and, and really hear what they have to say. I mean, I could easily grab some people now, but that's not the impact I want. I want from that time. So I'm still trying to track some of them down and hopefully get them in there. I definitely want to have their voice in there. I, I was actually going to plan on doing a 40 minute documentary just on the women. But until I get all of them and find them, it's going to be a little difficult. But I definitely want their voices to be heard. And it's very important. Good question. Um, in 2009, what do you see like dance and hip hop? Because uh, Kid and Play were in there, MC Hammer, and then uh, I can think of uh, the original lineup for uh, Black Eyed Peas yeah. with uh, that's, your, that's your Jam, but I don't see it in 2009. And, like, I guess like what's going on now? Like, does that era respect so Superman? So yeah. that dance, you know? So, yeah. Like, yeah. The ones that know it, yes, because it, there's a lot of confusion with what is hip hop dance now, yeah. and hip hop dance is just party dances. So your Soldier Boy will be it. Um, the bird walk, the stanky leg, the Dougie, the shark, the fade away, um, getting light, all that stuff is hip hop dances. You know, the Aunt Jackie, the Wild, every all that, that's hip hop dancing. And it's just a bunch of party dances. And, you know, those of us that know it look at it like, that's what it is. Choreography, great. Choreography is not a dance. And it's with the young people that I find when I talk to them, they think choreography is an actual dance. So I'm like, that's, that's just placement, you know? So, we're trying to clear up what it is, what it's not. I, I've been in several arguments with some of the old schoolers, if you want to say that, because I don't feel, and a few of them agreed after the argument, I don't feel b-boying is a hip-hop dance. It's, it, it's, to me, it's impossible for it to be a hip-hop dance. B-boying is a funk dance. It was created to funk music, and I don't know too many b-boys that actually break to hip-hop music, to rap music, except for Know the Ledge by Rock M. Other than that, a b-boy would tell you, I want to hear some breaks. And breaks come from old funk records, old jazz records. I mean, Earl Palmer is the person that they give credit to actually creating the break, who was one of James's drummers. 
and he took the sound from New Orleans' second line, and he created the breakbeat, and that's, they even put that in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I'm like, that's a funk record, and y'all dance to funk. And the last time I checked, you know, we got Stanky Leg is a rap song. We got all the rap song, right? Back in the day, we had the Wobble was a rap song. Be fat, I mean the Wop. Be fat to do the Wop. You had all these different dances. Not one of those dances was do the head spin, do the windmill, do the sit. No rap song ever came out like that. And that stuck. But you had all these other party dances. I'm like, y'all didn't even call it hip hop then. And they were even, when, when the term did become hip hop, and this is speculative, but there was a tour in 1981 where a lot of, if you want to say the original people at that time, went on tour, and they called that tour hip hop. The hip hop tour, that was in 81. And the conversation is that's why they called the culture hip hop, because they called the culture hip hop in 82. And they said it was after that tour. It was because of that tour. Um, but in the 70s, 73, 74, there was no hip hop music. It was just sampling from whatever kind of music people were playing. And your biggest DJs were DJ Hollywood, Eddie Chiba, you know, then Herc and all these other cats came into play and they were playing all the stuff they grew up with and, you know, extending the break beats on a lot of those old records. But the Rolling 808 wasn't invented. And that's what the real hip hop sound is, that deep bass sound. Because even when you listen to the stuff today, Half of, the, half of the MCs a day sample some old record, and the only thing they do is increase the sound of the beat and maybe add a couple of things here and there, but it's basically the same record. So I, I don't even see, like, I would argue a true hip-hop music. I would argue a sound, and that's the Rolling 808 sound and whatever mimics that sound. Like, if you listen to what's... Hold on. I'll try and pull it up. Kanye's... One of Kanye's songs... Uh, I can't think of the name, but I have it on here, and I have the original. Like, I collect, I, I like all the original. I was like, man, that's the same beat. I went through a lot of them one time a couple years ago. I went through a lot of sample joints. But Kanye, yeah, he does yeah. a straight sample one. But yeah. I think somebody like, um, like a DJ Premier or like a Dilla, yeah. they're not going to use the same. Right, they, they'll cut it up a bit. Yeah. They'll definitely cut it up a bit. And a lot of them are based off of whatever hook that they found, and that was the meat of that record. Yeah, sure. And they add stuff. So I'm still like, oh, yeah, I'm still playing this stuff. And the sad part is, I know they're supposed to put on a label, but I think the sad part for, for young people is that they don't investigate more to increase their knowledge of music. I was like, because you actually will probably find that you like a lot of other stuff that you didn't listen to. You know, I happened to meet a young person. I was working with an after school program um, through the Philadelphia Library, I think it was. And I met this young man. He was like, yeah, I want to be a producer when I grow up. So my first question was, well, what do you listen to? He was like, I listen to hip hop. I was like, okay, well, what else do you listen to? No, oh, just hip hop. I was like, that's impossible. I was like, bring any hip hop record in here and I'll show you a sample where they took something from. So you hearing something, even if it's a little bit, you're being inspired by some other sounds. And I told him, I was like, well, who's your favorite artist? And he said, Jay-Z. And I said, well, do you know who the Doors are? He was like, Doors. I was like, you don't know Jim Morrison? He was like, nah, I don't know. And then I was like, all right, you bring in Jay-Z's record, your CD tomorrow, and I'm going to bring in some stuff tomorrow. So I brought in the Doors 5 to 1 that Jay-Z sample from. Now, it doesn't matter who found that sample. Somebody is listening to other music. And I was like, you want to be a producer in this hip-hop world, you need to listen to some other music. Like, expand your mind. Just get into some other stuff. Don't be so closed-minded. And that was kind of the sense of me making a film because I got into too many discussions with dancers that was like, no, this started in the 70s. That's impossible. It didn't just explode. Everybody was influenced from somebody else, and that needs to be talked about. Because for as much as hip hoppers want to be like, now you got to give credit. Well, then y'all need to start giving credit. It didn't start in the 70s. There's a certain concept that may have started in the 70s because of what was still going on dealing with coming out of the 60s. And this whole thing with civil rights movement and some of the young people felt like they, you know, they were just pushed aside and it didn't work and all these other ideals. But you still have to look at that. Like a key, I think one of the key things in terms of emceeing to look at is Count Basie used to rhyme. I don't know how many everybody here knows who Count Basie is, but Count Basie used to rap. And as the big band leaders, they weren't just the conductor of the band. They were conductor of the hall that they were playing in. 
sometimes by them rhyming, they ignited the dancers to do their thing. And I have footage of Count Basie rhyming. And if I drop the hip hop beat, you would swear he just, somebody, some kid on the street just made this up. I mean, but it's real old school. But the thing I'm saying is, he used to play at Small's Paradise. Eddie Chiba and DJ Hollywood used to work at Small's Paradise from time to time. So I'm pretty sure that they heard this rhyming style, not just through Basie, but other band leaders. Also, you have uh, a Baltimore-born DJ, uh, Doug Jocko Henderson, who moved to Philly and spun it um, uh, DAS, and then he moved to New York. Not the only one, but Jocko used to rhyme all the time. If y'all, yep. And he was like, uh, um, he would say stuff like, ooh, Papa do, a uh, how do you do? And then say all this whatever. And that's how he would introduce like the Delphonics or um, you know, the Cadillacs or whoever he was introduced, he would run. And that I'm sure he was also an influence to like Hollywood, DJ Hollywood and Eddie Sheba. Because when you listen to them rhyme, they sound like radio announcers. All the old MCs, Melly Mel, Busy B, they sound like radio announcers. They have that radio voice. That kind of faded away. So when you listen to those old records, I'm sure that they were influenced by that. They don't tell you that. I'm like, y'all need to talk about that because that helps with the lineage. Instead of thinking, oh, it just popped up. Somebody just started spinning their head. Then I don't know what that kid on that movie set was doing, spinning on his head. And he did in that movie, in the clip that made the movie, he did three what B boys call pencil drills. That doesn't that doesn't get me going. What gets me going? is who else was he doing it with? He wasn't doing that by himself. <laughs> and how many more of those spins could he do off camera? Or did he just hit three in the movie? And all that tumbling, he was doing that with somebody else. So what were they doing? And where did they get it from? You know, like I said, we don't see it, but the retention from watching our, our elders, and you know, it's there. It's there. And then there's a certain way of communicating and dialoguing with one another in certain communities that just stays there. There's just an approach to it. There's this idea like this is how we dress, this is what we do, this is how we do it. And it just stays there. And it gets a little subtle and it breaks away, but you'll just keep seeing it. Coming up with the youth and you'll just be like, yo, how are these kids doing this stuff? They ain't see that. Well, this is the ideas of this community, of people or this area, this city is like, you know, how we communicate via music, language, um, I've been a b-boy for four years, and I've taught for two years. In your film, it kind of, it seems like you're deeming that people who learn in a studio environment are inferior to people who learn in the street environment. So how does that justify me teaching my students in a studio environment and my students learning in a studio environment? Do they go to the environment where it was created? No. Then they're not going to get it. Like, there's a difference between me learning how to speak Spanish in a classroom and me going to South America and soaking up the culture behind it and really understanding why. I can be book smart, but you need some street smarts too to really grasp, to really communicate with people because there's a different um, approach to what's going on. Like you can get some moves, but then you step into a circle and you might not, you know, you might, that, that love won't be there because it's a thing of there's dues to be paid and we honor that. And we want to see that. It's not to like tear you down or come at you. You know, those, those individual battles or rivalries, they might happen. But really, I think um, a circle is about getting together with a group of people that are into the same thing that you're into. So it's good to teach people in the studio, I think now, because, you know, we have a venue where we can actually get the information to them. Because back in the day, you didn't have it. You had to go to the clubs or be in the environment. You just didn't get it. You did your best to retain it however you might have saw it. But now I think it is good to be in a studio where somebody can come in, give them some knowledge, show them how to do things the correct way, but then you got to take them to the next level. That's here. That's good. Now you got to get out there and do it. You know, And that's going to be the thing that's going to send them to the next level. Because if they're only in the studio, they're not going to get it. you got to step out into that environment to really get a, to really get a handle on it. Would you rather the students learn only in the streets or in both the studio and the streets? I take both. I teach in the studio, but I see it. You know, I just got back from Japan. Them little kids will put it on you <laughs> in a minute. I just did a really good friend of mine, Clyde Evans. 
we just did, um, he just did, I had the honor of sharing the stage with him, just did a, a lecture demonstration at uh, Drexel, where I teach. And there's this really little, little black kid that came up on stage, because he has a period, you know, we audience partic participation, right? Little guy. Well, I don't know, what was he, seven maybe? Came up on stage, he was a little shy. I think he had it in him when he first got there, but when he got up there and he looked out, it was like, oh, I'm a little nervous right now, right? But there's this difference of what's going on here to what's going on there and how we get this information to kids. Because some kids in Japan will tear adults down. Like, they have the vocabulary, they have musicality, they have no fear, they have an idea of what this circle's about, how to handle themselves in a battle situation. So I think you need both, but you definitely need that, because that's it. That's like, in, in hip hop culture, I think there's one major thing that is it. There's only one thing in hip hop that anybody cares about, and it circulates throughout these four elements. Can you rock? I don't care what you learned in the studio, what you learned in the street, what you learned in the house. I don't care what kind of car you drive. I don't care who you choreographing for. I don't care what movie you made. So what? You got a record deal. Can you rhyme right now? Can you get on this mic and kill it? Can you get on these tables and rock this party? Can you spray something on the wall? Can you get in this circle right now? No? You dance for Justin Timberlake? I will smoke you right now. <laughs> That's all that matters. All other stuff is out the window. It's show and prove all day. And it's always going to be show and prove. It's always braggadocious. Somebody's going to try to up, one up you every time. So it's like, you're not prepared for that in the studio. When I teach, I see it. You know, these kids, they come, when I used to teach in studios, I don't teach in studios anymore. You know, they come to class and they have a ball, but it's just that one hour, or maybe that one hour and a half, that one day a week. And I would ask the kids, what do you listen to? They ain't never name a rap record. They don't listen to the music. Well, how are you going to get it if you don't listen to this music? You don't practice when you go home. You only do it when you come here to say, oh, I'm in hip-hop class. But you don't do it. You don't live it. And this is something that you live, not something that you do. You know, one hour out of the week is not going to get it. You got to want this. And I brought up Japan because they want it. They, Japan is probably the best place in the world for dancing right now. Like, they love all styles, not just one. They love them all. And they can flip. Like, this little kids, you go on, go on, live, go on YouTube and put in uh, Yumiki versus Sho. There's two little kids I teach in Japan. Ridiculous. Like, they go from popping to locking to whacking. To, they know all the styles. And everything in their whole body changes every time they go to each style. And they know their music. And it's insane. And this little kid got on stage and was shook. And I was like, you grab one of them little kids from over there, they're going to burn the building down. They're just going to dance till they can't dance no more. What's the words again? Uh, Yumiki. It's uh, Y-U-M-E-K-I and Sho, S-H-O. And they're in the same, you know, they, they learn the same studio, but they battle each other. In L.A., they were shutting adults down. It was embarrassing. They had adults nervous. They're like, okay, the kids, they got the cute factor, but they got skills. And it's just like, wow. And you just sit there and be like amazed. Like, I can't believe this is going on. So get, get them out of it. Like, learn them something, as they say down south. <laughs> it's my word. I'm going to learn you something. Learn them a bit, but you got to. I know they're kids, but you take them to whatever kind of an event, you know, that's kid-friendly. So they can kind of get that in them and see what's going on. And, you know, maybe they'll aspire to do it or be a part of it or maybe it'll influence them in a way or inspire them some kind of way. Or bring in footage of events or something and show them if you can't, you know, take them because they're too young or whatever. But they need to see that. They need to see, like, this is what it is. If you're really into this and you really want to get good, this is where it's at. This is what's going to take you to the next space. That's a long answer, but... Yeah. I think it's... Uh I think it, it's great because it offers uh, accessibility to it, you know, and um, especially in a safe environment. When I was younger, uh, I was eight when I first started dancing. With the, I used to dance in Catholic schools where during recess time, the nuns used to allow us to move the desks out of the back of the room during recess and, and spin. And that was it, you know, it was like we were too young to get in the clubs or whatever, but, you know, it would be the block parties, the, 
the thing is, is that you know, biting was a big thing, or is a big thing rather, and you wouldn't want to copy somebody else's move or style. So, um, if you saw somebody else or saw something that you liked, and you asked someone to teach you, the answer was no, right away. So, what you're offering them is a way in to that in a safe environment, and I think that, that I mean, it holds tremendous, tremendous value because you're allowing them to have a piece or even just a sample mm -hmm. of what it is. They may even decide from at that point on, maybe they want to continue, maybe they don't. But two, they can also then, at times, infuse that into dances that they want to do. Like maybe they begin to, you know, take modern later on, and they can use the information that you've given them about moving on the floor. You know what I mean? So there is definitely um, a huge value to what you're doing. But I agree, um, it doesn't exist in the studio today. It just, it just can't. I mean, just the atmosphere and everything is just, it's all wrong. But no matter how much you try, um, Rennie Harris, in fact, all the time when we used to dance with him. Uh, would say to the audience, what you're seeing right now on stage, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel like this. He was like, this is like 5% of what hip hop is. Yeah. I mean, after we were done dancing, we, we felt like we gave everything that we possibly could, could do. But on stage, he, he was right. I mean, it was just like, just being up there and people sitting and even though you're hearing the music, the music is loud, you're looking at your friend and you're trying to get all this energy from them and everyone's screaming at you, whatever, it just never was like the club. Because you can go out after that performance where you felt like you gave everything, go to a club, and be in a whole different environment yeah. and dance all night long. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I would have to agree. It does have to, it does have to transcend the studio. But uh, at this day and age, um, the studio is definitely a, a, a great place to, to get in entry level. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely agree with that. You know, we've, uh, just being out in the clubs, maybe like a year ago, you know, I'm sure everybody here is this, you know, is, is, how they say it, there's always one. There's a circle going, there's always one person drunk, wants to get in there, jump around, do whatever. And we got to this really big discussion afterwards, and we were just talking about how the conversation that's happening in that circle, an outside person doesn't know. But if you're giving information to kids, when they get to that point, they'll know how to, how to jump into that conversation. It'll make sense. Because there's a, once a circle starts, two, two things that happen. There's a fun circle where it's open to everybody, right? And then there's one that just has exclusivity because the right song came on and everybody's, you know, all those dancers, it, something clicks, nobody knows what. But it's like, oh, that's the hottest jam. That circle just turned into sacred ground. And it's not a game. We don't want you in here playing because we're not playing. And you come in and break that up, you got a whole bunch of dancers that's now getting really angry because they were in a whole other space. But like I said, we, this one kid tried to do it and one of our guys pulled him to the side and was like, listen man, you should learn how to do this stuff and then you could jump in. But right now, he's like, if you keep jumping in there, somebody might hit you. <laughs> and he told him real nice, like, uh, you know, you, you ought to learn. Hey folks. Uh, but Again, it's like Clyde said, that's a good way to get them exposed to it, to get them to understand it so that, you know, if they do stick with it, when they get to that space, they can jump in and, and, and have a ball and just get down. Any other questions? All right, well, let me, I don't know how much time we have, but I'll quickly, uh, I don't even know if you guys can hear this. Um, we can look it up the figures as well. Oh, let's see. Y'all hear this? This is Eddie Cheever. Made this later. This was made in um, the late 70s, the disco record. It kind of sounds like cross between disco and house. And house. And a little bit like blow. Yeah. And this, this is DJ Hollywood. And he has that Curtis Blow sign. Curtis Blow called him the first MC. Huh? Yeah, like they all had that sound. So I was like, you know, it's it's plausible that 
they had a strong influence from probably not just Jocko, but um, uh, I forget the name of the radio station, but Jocko was a huge DJ at that time, announcing you know all the groups. And the funny thing was, you know, the early DJs were the MCs, you know, just like the big band leaders, and the DJ was far more important than anybody else. Like if you saw all the old acts from back in the day that Alan Freed did or, or even Jocko Henderson, they used to produce tours. Their names was at the top, huge. And all these famous artists, their names are small down here. Georgia Boots was another big one. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure that they had a strong influence from them and then, you know, um, Smalls Paradise and just that whole as so, that whole scene because they are that age to have experienced that in that way and help pass that down, where you know the younger kids just didn't know it. And when you look, all the early rap groups, uh, Funky Four Plus One, Furious Five, Cold Crush Brothers, all of them, they had that same cadence, that same style. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, would you be willing to come back and do maybe once the film is completely finished, maybe? Have you thought about where you'd like to premiere it? Well, right now the, the goal is to have the film ready for the Tribeca Film Festival in April. In April. And um, from there we want to get it screened in the movie theaters because that's a good jump start um, for that particular festival. Most of the films that do really well pick up certain sponsorship and do find their way into the uh, movie theaters. So I'm hoping to do that and once it is finished, do um, a stronger college tour and screen it, possibly bringing two of the dancers from the film with me, um, preferably somebody from the East Coast, somebody from the West, and get that perspective. So hopefully that will happen. I do have, um, there's a smaller work coming out for, we have to have this finished by November 1st, I believe the deadline is. I'm working on a smaller documentary called The History and Concept of Hip Hop Dance. So that one, it's a, this one kind of covers a, a wider spectrum. Th this one is particular to hip hop dance, but it does talk a little bit about the culture and some of that lineage. Um, but we want to save that for the for the big picture. So that should be out. I'll get you a copy of it. That should be out. Um, uh, that should go into high uh, promotion in the beginning of November because they want to have it ready for the Christmas rush. Well, when you're interested in doing this one, remember us because maybe we could work on yeah. something big. I was going to say, um, yeah, um, next year. Um, the PCS Heritage Show is going to be it's music as our theme. So um, might be something interesting to do in connection with that. Uh, in connection with maybe um, yeah, like a hip hop dance or maybe like a simulation where we can show the difference between pop and like. <laughs> <laughs> you really hung up one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's a show we used to do. I think we're doing it uh, late January next year. Okay. So we'll get your information for that. Yeah, yeah, sure, certainly, certainly. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming. I know that you have been on your feet all day long, and I also want to thank all of you all for coming so much, and thank you for, um, course, for no. taking care of iTunes. <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna look for you to come back because I think that this would be I think this would have a great appeal to a, a, you know a, a much wider audience. Right, right. And we have a couple of film venues that this could work. I think we've got our cultural film series, and we've got a couple of ways, and as he mentioned about the, the heritage um, okay. show. So, but thank you very much for sure. coming. Sure, thank you for having me. Thank you guys for having me. And you all visit our website, the Africana Studies website. You can access it through the College of Arts and Sciences, and then you can, you know, you can get the Africana, specifically the Africana website and look for our gorgeous posters at the end of, you know, they're up now for fall. Like I said, we've got one more event, and then look for stuff that's coming next semester as well. Thank you again.